Hello, monsters and miscreants. My name is TB Skyn, and here's a video I've struggled to make for a while. This is uh, Nurse Hitomi's Monster Infirmary. It's a manga series uh, by an artist called Shaco, which I presume is a pseudonym. And I've been wanting to talk about it for a long time because it has been in my head for well over a year now. It's been in my head. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever really stopped thinking about this series because it does some things that I really don't... I struggle kind of to articulate. And this is why it's taking me so long to make this video is because in trying to discuss this series, I am unsure what I think. But I know that whatever I think, it's interesting. Like, or rather, not that my thoughts are interesting, but the thing is interesting. It's interesting to think about. It's, inter it's interesting to talk about. It's interesting to read and experience for a number of reasons. Now, part of the reason why I've been hesitant to make a video about it is, well, you might be able to guess it just by looking at the cover here, is demonetization. Demonetization is a very real risk with this video. Um, and it's the kind of thing I hope won't spread to the rest of my channel if it happens to one video. So, like, gonna take a shot. <laughs> So, Nursey Tomy's Monster Infirmary. The first thing that drew me to the series is the impeccable artwork. Like, it has it has some genuinely fantastic artwork. It plays around a lot with anatomy and proportions. It distorts characters in very interesting ways. And it has a really strong sense of character design. Like, much more than most other series that you will read at all. Especially Slice of Life series that take place in high schools. This is, from a character design perspective, really strong. There's a lot of really interesting, distinct characters with very distinct quirks and personalities. And so from that perspective alone, it's interesting enough. But then there's the premise. So in this world, the world of the comic, puberty sucks. And I know it also sucks in our world and sucks. it sucks in all worlds. There's no world in which puberty is cool or fun. But here it sucks for some unique reasons. When you reach puberty in this world, not only do the normal puberty things happen to you, like you get lots of hormones, you get lots of feelings you're not used to, lots of physical changes, things start to grow, hair appears in weird places and stuff like that. But in this world, you also gain a monstrous quirk of a sort, a monstrous attribute of some kind, some kind of extreme physical change that really doesn't happen to humans. In the case of the first patient who's on display in the series, that quirk is an extremely long tongue that she struggles to control. It seems to move with a mind of her own, and so it becomes a source of, of shame and embarrassment and, and fear for her. But as you look at these pages, you, prob you can probably tell why I've been hesitant to... Because that, that that tongue is a tentacle. That's that's what that tongue is in these pants. A tentacle is licking her eyeball and it's going between her breasts. And that's kind of the baseline for just how kinky um, this series gets. It, it gets extremely kinky without ever getting quite explicitly sexual. At least not in the way that you would expect from ecchi manga. Like, ecchi manga is a dime a dozen. It exists everywhere. Like, and and ecchi manga ha is distinguished by having a primary purpose of titillating the audience, right? It's it, the, the primary purpose of an edgy manga is to, oh, here's something sexy that you can look at and enjoy because it's, it's hot and it's sexy and ha ha ha. And that was kind of what's... When I got to this page here in the first chapter, I was kind of like, oh, okay, so it's an edgy manga. Okay, so this is just about monsters having kinky monster blah blah whatever and i was like okay i'll read the first chapter and we'll see we'll see how it goes but i really wasn't that interested because i thought okay this is just a thing that's this is just like boner material for someone but then um then you get to the end of the chapter now in an etchy manga you would expect that the usual progression of things is that things get more and more sort of uh, erotically charged right up until the end, and then it sort of backs off just enough to stay, you know, not pornographic, and then you do the same thing over and over again in the next chapter. Like I said, the etchy manga is usually distinguished by being primarily about displaying some weird kink or, oh, I fell on top of the boy and now the boy has a boner or something, and ooh, I can see boobies, or, like, it's not a shallow pandering, essentially. This chapter concludes in a slightly different way. Over the course of uh, her school class, and yeah, it, it definitely doesn't get any less kinky, she starts to feel like she's being looked at. 
Like everyone is looking at her, staring at her, noticing the tongue that she's trying to hide inside of her mouth to the point where the sensation of being vulnerable, being stared at, becomes so overwhelming that she passes out and is taken to the nurse's office. Where she has a conversation with our main character, Nurse Hitomi, where she says, I couldn't help but think about how I must look to other people. I'm so disgusting. I see. That's a hard thing to carry. I'm glad you told me. But what's frightening you isn't my eye, but your own self-perception. Everybody has times where they worry about how they appear to others, but often we're harder on ourselves than they could ever be. Moreover, the tongue is a very sensitive part of the body. I understand how having something that belongs inside you, out in the open, can make you feel exposed and vulnerable, but your tongue is special. Everyone has their hang-ups. But one person's hang-up might be another person's turn-on. It's difficult to take an honest look at yourself. It's okay to worry a bit, but try to accept yourself just as you are. You don't have to suffer alone. You can always come talk to me. My office door is always open. This is the emotional climax of the story. Like, and again, if this was just a sort of a porny, etchy manga of some kind, then the emotional climax of the thing would be the point where both characters are most erotically aroused, but that's not what's going on here. The emotional climax of the story is when this experienced authority person, this nurse, this person who, whose job it is to take care of the health and well-being of her students, tells a student who's suffering from severe anxiety and body image issues that it's okay to be who she is, that it's okay to be who you are, that you're not wrong, you're not disgusting, yes, you're going through changes, but it's gonna be okay, and you don't have to suffer alone. And that was kind of the moment when I started to be like, okay, something else is going on here. This is not just about the kink, like something else is going on here. This thing has something that it wants to say. Here's another chapter. Once again, we're definitely dealing with kink. We have two characters, one who is um, growing. He's, he's having a growth spurt as part of her puberty, but not just a normal, not just like if she's growing 10 centimeters, but in the sense that she's growing enough to burst out of her clothes in the middle of a school day. She also has a friend who conversely is growing smaller and smaller. And again, it's hard not to feel like there's some kind of kink, something going on here with like macro and micro. But again, that's not actually what the story is about. These two characters, the girl who's shrinking and the girl who's growing, have a relationship. Over the course of their childhood, the, the girl who's shrinking right now is was always the, the, the assertive one, the protector, the one in charge, the one who, who took care of her friend and protected her from anything that scared her, anything, anything that worried her, anything that disconcerted her. But now things are changing. Now they're going through puberty. Now her friend is growing bigger and bigger and eventually... She can't, she's gone too small to protect her friend anymore. But her friend has grown and become larger. And this causes a rift between them, an emotional rift, where she can't deal with what's happening to her, the changes that are happening to her. She can't deal with feeling helpless. She can't deal with the change that's happening in their relationship, and it causes this massive rift in their ancient friendship, which is once again resolved when she goes to talk to the nurse and has an open, honest, emotional heart-to-heart -heart about the issue, and both she and her friend undergo an, a bit of an emotional journey where they come to view each other, rather, instead of holding on to their old relationship, they come to view each other as equals and they gain a new relationship understanding with each other that is more equitable and which lets them be more happy about who they are and where their lives are going also they're lesbians like they're in love with each other i'm just gonna say it right now that it's, it's not outright confirmed but it's really very extremely super heavily implied and again like you look at oh it's 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 the tiny tiny girl and the very large girl and that's surely that has to be some kind of kink thing but the story never seems to think so. The story never really cares that this, like, maybe it's some kind of kink to someone, but that's not really what the metaphor is doing. And that's what I find so interesting about this story, is that you have these characters who are undergoing these monstrous changes, but they're not just 
oh, this would be fun to see. They're being used for a storytelling purpose, which is the primary thing of our primary character, Nursi Tomi. The reason why she has a giant eye in the middle of her forehead is because she's extremely clear-eyed about what her students need, the kind of emotional pain they have, the emotional reassurance that they need, the things that are happening to them. She can see through them. She can see them clearly. And by the way, the theme of, like, the, the feeling of just being seen, of being known, of being understood is emotionally very powerful, which is, if you've ever been someone who felt completely alone and, like, nobody understood you or cared to see you for who you are, you will know that. So, so that alone, as a, as a visual metaphor, is quite powerful. But also, as, as they point out, as she points out in this chapter, is the tongue, it's not just a kink thing. It's a sensitive part of the body. So the metaphor here is that something very sensitive inside her, like like some inner part of her, is being exposed as part of the changes that are happening to her body, and it's terrifying her. It's scaring her. It's overwhelming her to have this sensitive, vulnerable part of her exposed to other people's looks, to other people's judgments. And the way the, the story is resolved is by having her overcome that fear and shame to see that sensitive, that vulnerable part of her as something to be proud of, as something to be put on display, as something to have fun with, some part of her that she doesn't have to fear, but which can be a part of who she is as a person in a positive way. Oh, and also Jean-Luc Picard, isn't in this, he's a side character. And I'm not, it's not just that it's a bald guy who kind of looks like Patrick Stewart, no, no, he's called picard -kun. It's Jean-Luc Picard, Jean-Luc Picard isn't this thing. You know who else is in this thing? There's an undead girl as one of the students at the school. She's undead. Um, she has been dismembered um, so at some point in the past. But because she's immortal, she just kind of gets stitched back together. And she has a problem where she kind of keeps falling apart. This chapter um, depicts some of her backstory. It explores like, oh, she's actually impossible to harm because she, uh, she, can, she can be taken apart and put back together. And she regenerates from any wounds. And... We get her backstory, and um, we get we get to, to learn about like her, her family relationship. That that the person who revived her was her grandfather, who's no longer with her, who she misses very much, and who's a, who's an important emotional part of her life. And um, her grand her grandfather is George George Romero. That is he is George Romero. He's George Romero as a demon. George Romero, the, the 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 guy who invented the zombie genre, the guy who invented Dawn of 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 the dead, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn. Of, George Romero, father of the modern zombie film genre, is the the grandfather of one of the characters in the story. And this <laughs> and this entire chapter has absolutely no sexual content whatsoever. Like unlike the other chapters, where it's like you thought, okay, maybe this is some kind of etchy manga. No, not so much. This is an emotional heart-to-heart -heart between a girl who is has a complicated relationship with her past and her body getting to meet her grandfather, who's a badass, zombie-fighting demon in hell. Oh, and also, he's George Romero. He's <laughs> George Romero with a gun. And he's... He's George Romero. I, I can't, I still don't, I, every time I see this, I can't get over that it's George Romero he's in a manga. And in the emotional climax of this particular chapter, George Romero turns into a giant muscular demon and fights a giant horde of zombies in order to save his granddaughter from the zombies. And here's the thing. Outside of, like, it's just sort of a, a standard emotional uh, reconciliation between a granddaughter and a grandfather who left her too early, and she's sort of dealing with the trauma of his death, and that's sort of what the chapter is about on an emotional level. But it's clearly also just because the artist, Shaco, wanted to draw George R. Romero fighting zombies in hell as a giant badass demon, and because he gets to do whatever he wants, he put Jean-Luc Picard and George Romero in his manga, and that was just a thing that he could do because he wanted to. That's the other thing that started attracting me very heavily to this manga, was the sense of fun. Like this just unrestricted pop culture obsession fun that infects the whole of things. Oh, by the way, there's also a Wookiee um, in the cast. One of the teachers is a Wookiee. He's, he's called Moji Sensei, he's a Wookiee, he's got a lot of hair, and he's very big and soft. And a part of his story is that one of his students has an unrequited crush on him. Like, the, the, in fact, two of his students have a crush on him, and they kind of fight over him. 
And usually, again, in an edgy manga, you would kind of expect that, the, oh, they get into all kinds of hilariously misunderstood situations. Ah, ha, ha, the, the students fell on top of her and they think he's a pervert or something. But there's really none of that here. There's none of that sort of playing into the teacher-student kink in this story at all. In fact, the teacher is extremely careful and studious about keeping the boundary of never, ever, ever allowing his students' crush on him, which he's somewhat aware of, to progress beyond just being a, a childish crush that he knows that they'll get over, and he never, ever, even so much as implies that he's going to act on it, which, again, subverted my expectations, because, once again, from... Okay, so this thing that starts with a kinky tentacle tongue thing is not going to go there? It's not going to, to go for the student-teacher sort of forbidden romance kind of thing? That was kind of refreshing. Anyway, uh, he has to be a swim teacher for a while, so he has to shave all of his hair off, and when he does, he becomes an extremely hot dude. Again, seemingly just because the artist likes to have fun with this stuff. <sighs> we also have um, these characters here. This guy grows um, a second head on his shoulders that he has a very, he has a very complicated relationship with. He has... Um, kind of a narcissistic personality disorder. And the head that grows on his shoulder is sort of a literal representation of that. And the chapter that focuses on him specifically goes into the very complicated feelings you can have about liking yourself when your body is changing, the very complicated feelings you can have about when you are not interested in other people in the same way that you're sort of supposed to be, when you don't necessarily have romantic attraction to other people. And so he grows a second head, and coming to terms with that second head's presence on his body is a big part of his emotional arc. And also that second head happens to be female. And then we have this guy, and he he is a guy, and he is sort of, um, think of My Hero Academia as uh, Minata. Um, that little, like, he's, sort, he's sort of the pervy, obsessed guy who's just constantly thinking about breasts and constantly harassing girls to touch their boobs. And part of his transformation as a person is he grows breasts he doesn't become a girl he just he just grows breasts those same breasts that he is so obsessed with and which he pesters and harasses girls about he grows breasts and then he has to start dealing with the experience of having breasts like they're heavy they cause his back to ache they itch they get sweaty he has to deal with all of the physical troubles that come along with it and more than that he has to deal with his male classmates harassing him over his breasts, and you're thinking, okay, yeah, we've seen that before, oh, it's, it's, you're planted into the different body, you learn how to be the different person, and then you return to your normal state, and having a greater understanding of the difficulties of being another person, except there's a twist here, he not, he chooses to start dressing as a girl, he chooses to embrace, okay, so I have this feminine shape, I'm gonna dress like a girl, and then he goes right back to, her, to, to, well, not harassing, but to still, Pretty much being a dude who's completely and utterly obsessed with breasts, despite having his own pair and having a greater understanding. He, instead of it, tell, it, it teaching him to stop obsessing over breasts, it teaches him to stop, start obsessing over breasts with greater empathy for the struggles of having them. And so he leaves other girls alone and primarily concerns himself with his own breasts. And he decides to dress like a girl because it makes him look pretty. He decides to lean into this change to his physical form, and he f finds out that he can actually regulate his own female hormone levels so that if he wants to, he can make the breasts go away or grow back. And the reason I'm not show I I'm talking about his chapter, but I'm not showing it, because that chapter does have some naked boobs in it. So I, I'm courting demonetization hard enough as it is. But anyway, this leads into a third chapter where we have uh, Nurse Hitomi's um, student, uh, rather assistant nurse, who's a plant person. They are a plant person, and as such, they don't really have a gender. They prefer to present as sort of female, but they have a long chapter exploring. Okay, so what if you what if you are a person who don't you don't have a conception of what your gender is? You don't know what it is. You don't understand what it is. How do you reconcile that with fitting into society? How do you choose a presentation that, that works for you? How do, how do you choose who you want to look like, who you want to be, when this very fundamental part of how the world thinks you're supposed to work isn't quite the same 
as it would be for other people. And so their chapter deals substantially with the troubles that other people have when engaging with them in that they, this person doesn't have that categorization you can't really work with it and that too again is like that's a some substantially deeper emotional subject than i was expecting from like this long tongue kink simulator that i was promised in the first chapter and this is why this series of has been so much in my head so here we have um this is probably the closest to demonetization we're going to get over the course of this video. We have a girl who's an octopus girl. So she has a lower body that's made of tentacles. And you think you know where this is going, right? Maybe you do. But I'll bet you you don't. Because this octopus girl, she has a crush on another girl. Who looks like this. who has a giant hole in the middle of her face. And as far as I understand, that's uh, a Japanese monster. It's a yokai, it's a Japanese demon type of a sort. <clears throat> and so the tentacle girl has a massive crush on hole in face girl, which is resolved in this chapter. As she starts stuffing her tentacles into the hole in her face. And this chapter has messed with my head a little bit because it is undeniably such a sexual concept, right? She's stuffing tentacles inside of an orifice. There's really no way around that. But take a look at how this is presented. Rather than this being sort of a, a, a physical pleasure sensation, what she feels as her tentacles sink into the head of this other girl she has a crush on is she gets in touch with her mind. She gets to understand her consciousness. She gets to get close to this person in a way that she can't get close to any other person ever. She sinks into her. And look at the imagery. This is almost horror imagery where she gets to experience the pain and the fears and the doubts that this girl has and, and the anxiety and the shame that she has because of this giant hole in her face that makes it hard for her to, to relate to other people. And then... We exit this sort of Vulcan mind melt situation where they realize that they both have a crush on each other. And we come to this scene, which is undoubtedly post-coital. Like, this looks like the aftermath of actual intercourse, except no one is naked. There's no bodily fluids. There's no, oh, haha, we had an orgasm kind of thing going on. It's two people who have related to each other in a profoundly intimate way that is presented in a way that should be very, very sexual, but which, again, ends up being instead profoundly emotional. And now they're girlfriends, and I think it's adorable. <laughs> yeah. And this is the thing that's been messing with my head, because here's the thing. As I mentioned before, I'm 30. And so, I'm not, I don't really want to read manga with, like, schoolgirls and panty shots and, 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 you know, teenagers awkwardly stumbling around sex. So, like, that's, that's, first of all, it's kind of creepy and you shouldn't do it. And second of all, no, ugh, please don't. And so I've been, in my head, I've been trying to figure out, is this titillation? Like, is this, what am I getting from these stories, like, is there a part of me that is getting sexually titillated by this stuff? And I honestly can't tell you, like, I honestly can't tell you because on the one hand, this imagery is so obviously sexual that there's really no way you can say, oh, there's absolutely nothing sexual about it. Of course, there's, there's, of course there's some, she's stuffing tentacles into an orifice. Of course there's something sexual about it. But it's also not. I'm not turned on by any of this, like, at all. Not just because it's, you know, teenagers, high school kids, and you, but also because just the way that the story relates to these images, the way it uses these visual metaphors of she's literally probing into her mind, right? She... That's one of the... By the way, one of the character traits that this character has is that she's nosy. She's really curious she really wants to 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 know stuff about people 
And that is visually exemplified by her having literal tentacles. Like, she's literally always, you know, sticking her hands where they don't belong. She's always kind of messing in stuff where she doesn't belong. Whereas this girl has a hole for a face. And one of the, the defining characteristics that she has as a character is that she's inscrutable. That she's hard to relate to. People can't really... Don't really talk to her. People don't really understand how she feels. People don't really know who she is as a person because she never... They, they can't get an expression out of her, right? So there's this dual thing going on where the monstrousness of the characters is a visual metaphor for who they are as people as well as an excuse for the artist to draw undeniably kinky shit as well as a handy visual metaphor to explain the relationships and the emotional stakes of the story and the ways in which the characters relate to each other on an emotional level. And Jean-Luc Picard is in it. And there's a Wookiee in it. And George Romero is in it, and he's a demon who fights zombies in hell. And Deadpool is in it. Dead, dead, well, it's not Deadpool, but it is Deadpool. Here, this is um, a story within the story. It's a manga within the story of the comic, which features as its protagonist this ninja guy who... It's been a month since the last issue. I'm sick of talking to a stain in the wall. Hey, won't you come talk to me? I'm dying of boredom here, and so we see that this is like a Western superhero comic, or at least insofar a Western superhero comic as imagined um, by an Eastern artist. And then we see a hand turning the page, and here's one of the characters saying, "I hate this kind of lame meta crap in manga. If you just you just want to break the fourth wall." And then we have an entire chapter dedicated to. A bunch of the characters from the story breaking down the metafictional concept of the fourth wall. So they're for, they're breaking the fourth wall. You can see she's holding on to uh, to talk boxes and stuff like that. Breaking the fourth wall while explaining what the fourth wall is and how the fourth wall can be used in storytelling while using the fourth wall in storytelling using a character who's clearly extremely clearly patterned after dead after deadpool after western western comics but after deadpool in particular because he has special colored um, speech bubbles and he keeps breaking the fourth wall and cracking stupid jokes and the characters become aware like there's one character um in the story who has the ability to see the fourth wall of the comic itself and she's a 2D person. Like, that. she sees a person who's completely flat. That's her monstrous trait. And that allows her to see the boundaries of the comic itself. She can see the speech bubbles. She can see um, the panel walls. She can even manipulate reality a little bit. And another one of the characters is also, just by sheer cynicism, is able to see talk bubbles and is able to manipulate a little bit about the reality of the comic itself. So we have this comic, which is... Kinky, weird-ass, tentacle shit. And it's a metaphor about the difficulties of going through puberty and, and self-doubt and, and, and pain and, you know, the troubles of falling in love, the troubles of relating to another person who is as different from you as it's possible to be while still having empathy for other people. And it's a fourth wall breaking sort of meta. Like there's a couple of chapters like this, which are just like extended meta narratives, having meta conversations about the nature of storytelling in comics through the medium of storytelling in comics, using characters that are aware of the fourth wall. And there's a Wookiee in it. And Jean-Luc Picard is in it. And George A. Romero is a demon fighting zombies in hell. I wanted to do this video as a complex script, you know. As I, I like, I wanted to write down a full script. I wanted to like uh, to like uh, create a, a specific um, sort of a, an overarching thesis, and I wanted to explore it in like a very heavily structured way. But the more I tried to do that, the less I could because Jean Luc Picard is in this manga. And George A. Romero fights zombies in hell, and there's a Wookiee, and there's a number of- Deadpool is here, except not really here because then they get sued, but Deadpool is here, and he's breaking the fourth wall while breaking the fourth wall in a chapter about breaking the fourth wall. And there's kinky tentacle shit. <laughs> so at this point, the, the thing I hope I've communicated to you 
is that this is one of the most interesting manga I have ever read. Certainly the most interesting one I've read this year, and, and, and in years, it has an incredibly interesting approach to storytelling, incredibly interesting approach to its own characters. There's, the, there's tons of characters we haven't even touched on. Like, there's a giant tiger furry who is massively into femdom, and he's a masochist, and there's also a lesbian dragon girl um, who's, a, who's like a total princess archetype is very superior to other people, and there's a mouse boy who likes to cross-dress, and the, num the amount of shit that happens in this thing, and also there is like a couple of romantic subplots about Nurse Hitomi herself and her childhood crush, who's a dude with four arms, who really doesn't like large breasts, and so uh, there's a hilarious kind of comedy dynamic between them, and also Nurse Hitomi has a dad who's a literal bear, and they have a family dynamic as well. She has a sister who has three eyes, and depending on which set of eyes is open, she has a completely different personality. And one of those personalities is a violent sociopath. Um, just, there's so much <laughs> in this fucking manga that I can't even begin to fully tell you what I think about it because I don't know what I think about it because it's so clearly kinky. It, it, but it's also not interested in being kink. It's not really interested in, in being sexual gratification for anyone. It uses its metaphors creatively to do interesting things. And to do kink... I, yeah, I'm rambling at this point because it's like Jean-Luc Picard is in this thing. And there's a Wookiee, and George A. Romero fights demons in hell, and there's tentacles. So yeah. Nursey Tommy's Monster Infirmary is on Amazon. You should check it out. If nothing else, just because there's absolutely nothing else like it. So, thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, you can leave a like down below. I know this was kind of a completely unstructured ramble, but it was literally the only way I could find to, to even begin to organize my thoughts about this thing. I hope I don't get demonetized. You can subscribe if you're so inclined. There is a uh, bell icon next to the subscribe button. Once you click on it, that'll help you to actually be subscribed. Uh, is also a Patreon. Yes, I have a Patreon. I'm still distracted just from thinking about this thing. I still don't know how I feel about it. I have a Patreon where if you have a dollar that uh, that you don't mind parting with, that like, if, you, if you don't mind me having an extra dollar a month to pay for rent and clothes and food and stuff like that, then Patreon.com is, is where you can go and you can... You, uh, Patreon.com slash Caster Comics. There's a link down below and also on the screen in a little bit where you can go and you, you can send me that dollar and I'll use it to not die, uh, which, which, which is a nice thing. And there's a few rewards and stuff you can get over there. You, you, you can head on over there if you're so inclined. If, you're not, if you don't uh, want to or you can't uh, support me with any money, that's completely okay. I'm just happy that anyone watches through these long ramble videos <laughs> sometimes. Uh, so thank you very much for, for even being here. There's also a dislike button um, down below, which uh, you can click on. But if you do click on it, I warn you, it might induce a random uncontrollable mutation in your genome, which will either give you superpowers or cancer. It's, it's going to be one or the other, and I can't really tell you which, and I can't really tell you the odds. Like, personally, I may, I clicked it, and I, I, I can now shoot spiderwebs out of my wrists, which is not, not as great as you'd think, because they come out of little glands. And it, it's really quite slow. On I, I can't really swing with it, but I've been able to to do some incredible quilting. Uh, you should really come and see it someday. I'm probably gonna sell that on Etsy. Uh, so if, if you're gonna click the dislike button, you know you go ahead. Maybe you get spider silk glands on your wrists that are kind of gross, and they, they have a weird smell. You have to clean them all the time. I don't know. Uh, so you can, yeah. Uh, 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 thank you very much for watching. <laughs>